Okay, and we are live with our 27th episode of Absolute Absec. I'm Ken Johnson at CK Tricky on Twitter, and I'm joined by my co-host Seth Law at Seth Law on Twitter. Hey, everybody. Welcome once again. Uh, this is number 27. We're just getting up there. Just keep rolling. Uh, I know we were out last week, uh, mainly because both Ken and I were in Vegas in the heat for DEF CON and other black hat like uh, security summer camp whatever you want to call it activities um, but this week we are joined by jim manico jim say hi hey how you doing gentlemen how's it going ken how's it going seth we are hey, super we're... thrilled to have you on i'm thrilled to be here thanks for having me <laughs> yeah so 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 how how this is structured usually right i mean we're gonna have questions for you um uh, I want to do introductions. You've, you know, you're probably familiar with the podcast format, right? Um, and we had a, a little discussion before it, but um, I, I think I'll let Ken kind of do the the initial introductions, and then we've got questions. And there's a lot that we want to talk about, just from the history, like getting to know you in the industry. I mean, both you and I have bounced around for a while, um, but then also, you know, where you see things going and what else is going to happen in the next couple of years and what you foresee. So Ken, why don't you run away with the introduction and then we'll jump from there. Yeah, the, the first thing I want to say about Jim, because I've known Jim for a bit, is uh, if you ever get a chance to pick Jim's uh, brain for like an hour or two, take, take up that offer, go do it. Um, you won't regret it. I know we've had a lot of people on the podcast, but uh, I always enjoy conversations with Jim. Um, and, you know, for those of you who may not know who Jim is, uh, he... So he's done so many things. He was an OWASP board member at one point. He is the owner of Manicode. And in terms of training, I don't think I know anybody who's done more AppSec training than Jim. He's really, really good at it. Uh, he he co-authored the uh, Ironclad Java. He co-organizes Locomoco Sec. Uh, basically, J Jim's going to keynote AppSec Cali in January of 2019. This guy's all over the place, uh, always doing crazy awesome stuff. So um, that's my intro for Jim. Thanks for, again for, for joining us, Jim. Ken, I'm really honored for that intro. Thank you for all your kind words. And it's, it's a big honor for me to be here. I've known you and Seth. You, we've all been in AppSec for a very long time. We're old, Ken. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to what, what we can do in this conversation to help folks you know, learn more about application security. Let's do this thing. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so maybe uh, like, Kind of the first one, the first thing that we usually try to do is ask people about how they got into the industry, right? I mean, the very first episode that Ken and I did, that was, that was kind of the introductions that we stuck with, and we've done it with everyone that's been on the show, especially the first time. Uh, I know you've been around for a long time, but tell us a little bit about what got you into application security and what the path was that brought you into it. Well, uh, I began my career like the late 90s as a programmer, and I... I spent you know, a decade slinging mostly Java enterprise web code. That's my main technical background and my, my education and work experience. When I moved to Hawaii, I met an individual named Stephen Northcutt, who worked at the time for the Sands Institute, which is a, a very big security education firm, mostly in the NetSec arena. And <clears throat> I began working for Stephen. And he was like, Jim, anyone can be a hotshot programmer. But if you learn security, if you follow my path, Jim, and start learning security as a developer, you're going to be unstoppable in a decade, but you got to work for me for a while first. And so I did. Like at the height of working for SANS, I was working 100 hours a week, no joke, no exaggeration, not because anyone told me to, because it was app set time. It was secure. I was learning as a developer what security was from some fantastic educators, and it was a great time. And it's because of Stephen Northcutt is why I got in security. Love you, Stephen. You know I do. Stephen Northcutt, remember awesome. that name. Yep, I, I just posted it on you know, at least the, uh, the YouTube chat channels. I mean, if people have questions, make sure and get them in, right? Whether that's on uh, on YouTube or in the Absolute AppSec Slack channel. Um, we're, we're, we're just, we're just going to keep rolling. Or if you want to troll us, I'm pretty sure there's a couple X aspect people or uh, X others that would love to troll either in, any one of us. So uh, I'm Jim, that's pretty good. Bring, bring on the trolls. Come on. We can we can handle a few little trolls. Bring them on. Bring them bring on. Them on. That. Bring on the app trolls. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I, I find that pretty interesting because I think about that same time, right? You're, you're talking late 
late nineties, early two thousands. That was the time that I moved into the industry as well. Like, you know, it sounds very familiar, right? I was doing Java, uh, you know, programming and then got into security, but it was more net sec related, right? I was, I was building tooling around network security tools. And I remember the first time like, you know, finding like SQL injection in a, in a website and like just being so blown away about, oh yeah, this, this coding stuff that I've been doing, there's security aspects to it, right? Um, so it's a very ex exciting way to actually move through it and get into the industry. Um, I'm trying to rem remember where I'm going with this, but uh, like, so when you started, right? <laughs> So you started doing SANS, you started doing training in that case. Is that what you're doing for Steven? Yeah, near, near the end of my time. Well, I was I was working as a programmer, at running, okay. helping run the vendor department. I was coding the vendor department software while helping uh, run part of the sales team. And I'm not a professional salesman, but you know, I, I, I help there to some degree. I helped run the floor show at the conferences. And I was studying to be a, a, a trainer there as well. I just and I I love working for Sands. That was a early part of my career. is one of the most exciting times because it was a big big time of learning. So I, I still have a lot of respect for for the Sands Institute. It's definitely an institute. Much respect through it. Okay, so yeah. uh, um, and from there I went and worked for Aspect Security. And some of the our good friend the trolls are were, were from that era of AppSec, and it was also a great time. But I was not an AppSec professional for them. I was a programmer. I, I help I help build their um, a piece of software for their company. And one of the aspect people is asking about it, a pointed question, right? Well, I I don't know who that is. I would love to call them out by name, but I don't leak intellectual property when I've signed an NDA. And so the work I did with aspect is under NDA. So I'm not going to talk about it out of great respect for my former employer. So <laughs> now obviously that other aspect person does not have any respect for their NDA or former employer. I weep for their lack of integrity, but I'm used to it from that crowd. So it's all right. Let's move on. Move on. <laughs> oh, yeah. You got oh, your answer. Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. About that. Oh, you got your answer. You asked for no, it. No. You got it. And, 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 and for the record, I am super grateful that I had a chance to work for Aspect. This is, again, I, I most of the work I did was with Dave Wickers, who was uh, – who helped design the software. And he's a brutal effing QA taskmaster like no one is. A few times I'd hang up on him on the airport, like, no, I'd hang up on him when I'm running to a plane. But I, I really liked working for Wickers. He has a sharp brain and uh, it was hard to keep up with. So I, I, I learned a lot. Left, left aspect, uh, left aspect and, wow, where did I go then? Left aspect and went to White Hat Security, right? Was, was That's right. Name. I, I, I was forgot a, that you did a stint at White Hat. How was yeah, that? They, they bought. They bought one of my comp. They bought my static analysis company with Eric Sheridan and Jerry Hoff. The real brains behind this was Eric Sheridan, who wrote and still works for and writes a White Hat static analysis engine. And so, and I did a very different role. This is the first non-technical role. I was a. Uh, uh, I was like. Uh, an evangelist. I tr I did teaching. I handled all their AppSec training classes. That's not their main business. It wasn't a focus of the business, but I, I handled that part of the biz for them. And I did a lot of evangelism. I traveled conference to conference to conference and uh, and represent White Hat at different security conferences. I learned something in this era. This is a weird era because they're buying my company. I, I didn't. They didn't really hire me. They bought me, and it was. It's it's awkward when acquisitions happen in terms of the, the power struggles between management and new people coming in. It's it's if it was a Facebook status, what would it be? Complicated. It'd be complicated. It was complicated. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, you know, I was a I, I ended up doing evangelism for him. It was it, it's also an exciting time. I thank Jer Grossman for this. I thank Jeremiah because. He basically gave me a corporate credit card and said, go out and represent us as you think is right and do good for us. He gave me a lot of freedom just to get out there and do things. And a few times I was asked like, all right, Jim, what are you actually doing for us? All right, it's been six months. What are you doing? I love when people ask me that. I'm like, here, hang on for a sec, Jeremiah. Boop. Yeah, here's my daily work log of everything I've done the last six months. Any questions? Ah, okay, you can go now. So this is the la all of you in IT, all of you who are young professionals, old professionals, any of you who like work for a living, keep a daily log of everything you do. A day will come where they're going to be called upon the carpet. 
A day will come where people will will want to give you a prize or an award for your work. And this the, building a log of what you do is self marketing. It it demonstrates what you've done when when asked or called on the carpet. That's been a very valuable tool as a professional throughout my career for what it's worth. Yeah, I mean, I do a weekly log. So I, I go through like, uh, you know, pre prep for the next week, do the same thing, create a gotcha. checklist and say like, these are the things, you know, on that checklist that did or did not get done. And, um, you know, do it all over again. It's a good, it's a good thing to do. You're right. Yeah. yeah and that's, I, I mean, that's very similar to kind of what uh, Jerry Gamblin, when he was on, was talking about as well was, uh, you know, he's, hey, as you're working through these problems, document it in some way. Like he was very much on the, on the side of actually publishing a lot of things, whether that's a blog post or Twitter, you know, yeah. uh, tweets out that, hey, this is, this is what's helped me. This is what I've been working on. And you can always kind of refer back to that because, you know, I, I don't know about you, Jim, but I like, I forget stuff all the time and I'm, I'm constantly like, oh, well, I know I did this about six months ago, but I don't remember. So now I have to recreate yeah. all this research. But if I look in my log, it's very easy to be like, oh, that's right, here it is. And just pull it back out and you move on, right? Exactly. I, I, I do work, I, I'm an I'm a entrepreneur, I, I run a company and I do my work at all odd hours. So keeping careful notes as I go, I have a notes folder that I have variety of different things that I track, I can't, you know, I can't tell you how valuable that is. Uh, something as simple as having a, a, a folder called notes, I have different notes for my schedule, different notes for my main to do's, different notes for the different content I'm working on. I have different notes for other partners that I'm talking with. So when I have a meeting with them, I, I pop up that one simple text file and bazing, I'm back to back to where I need to be for that conversation. Like a, and I, they're not complete notes; they're basically memory pointers into my brain of where I need to shift that that you know that pointer to to to, to, to start reading memory to to get into the conversation. Little things like that I think are valuable, especially in complex industries like application security. Absolutely. In terms of things you're working on right now, could you right. tell us a little bit about some of the training? Because I know you're going to give training, and let me post a link, but you're going to give training at AppSec USA. It's a two-day course. Um, but can you talk a little bit about your current kind of like what, what you're training developers uh, in terms of, I think it's a, this is a secure code course. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to put this oh, yeah. on the, in the That's link all I in teach. here. All right, I put the link in there for, for everyone. But uh uh, and the cool thing, by the way, is these YouTube uh, live chats now, they actually stick around when you watch the videos. Oh, so nice. The chat's still, yeah, that's very nice. Uh, very cool, Kevin. So the link's there. Um, but yeah, so can you tell us a little bit about like, what are you teaching developers these days? Like, what are the important things to cover? Um, and then I have a follow-up question to that as well. No, I, I, I appreciate being asked this. You know, this is a really exciting part of my life. And uh Usually I try to de-emphasis my own company and talk more OWA style. This is not one of those podcasts, so I'll go for it. I'm very, I'm very honored that you asked me to do so. So I'm a secure coding trainer. You know, I basically build PowerPoint slides, show up, deliver them with some labs, and teach developers how to write secure software. And I, I focus on web and web service type of security. Stick to just that. I focus on it as much as I can. I'm constantly researching and trying to learn new things. And... Uh, it, it, the way that I teach is I break up all my content into many one to two hour presentations, like a big conference. And I show my customers or conferences or, or, or freebies that I'm doing. I show people a large list of content and let them custom pick the curriculum. And if they don't want to do that, I, I, I make best guess at what I think is best for them. And I think that's an important part of being an educator, uh, uh, having these little learning objects so you can assemble custom curriculum for any customer. And uh, I, I built that in from the ground up. When I really first started writing slides in earnest, I built them that way from day one and just build empty slide decks of things I knew I'd want to build in the future and eventually you know, filled them out over time. And, 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 and when, you, when you're on stage, it's half performance, it's half knowledge. So I study, try to be as academic as possible and have good examples of how to do this stuff. But I try to be entertaining on stage. I try to make it so people are not going to you know, fall asleep or regret that they had this experience, usually two days, I want them to walk away from that being like lifted up and excited and enthusiastic to do security again. If I've done that, then, then I'm successful. If people walk out of there feeling drained or like beaten down or upset from the class, which has happened before in some situations, 
and that's a failure. So you know, we're, we're, we want to inspire people to like dig into this, you know, massively complicated topic with, with the plum and it's, it's not easy to do. So that's a really anyways, good point. So. Like if it, if it sucks to sit through that class, no matter how great technically it is, if it sucks and I got to sit there two days and it's like by hour three, I'm just waiting for lunch to come. Then, uh, yeah, it's great. You got all the technical details right, but I have no interest in the topic that you're talking about. Exactly. I don't want to go back to my desk and hear anything more about it. If anything, it's the opposite. So like that's a that's an interesting like kind of thought process on that that I honestly hadn't that hadn't really gone through my mind before. Like to like being entertaining is actually a pretty big benefit um to getting people on board to actually want to learn more because you're not going to learn everything in two days, but you, no. you're right. You make a good point with that. You might be inspired within two days to learn a little bit more. I, I, and that's an interesting point in general, right? I mean, speaking at conference as well, uh, you know, you think about that compressed time frame that you have to actually get your point across, right? Two days is, is one thing. And, you know, like Jim, obviously you have a lot of energy, right? Um, but even then I remember talking to you at code mash, right. After what, two or three days of training that you had done there. And I remember having the discussion, you're like, guys, I want to talk, but it, I've been on for two, two, three days and I just need to go decompress. So you just gotta <laughs> leave me alone. Right. And I'm very, very familiar with that after years in the industry and trying to share topics and going and doing training because there, that entertainment aspect is not something that is very well discussed or very well understood by the technicians in our industry, right? Um, they they want to get up and give their conference talk and they're like, look, here are the 500 things that I did. And here's 600 slides for me to get through in 20 minutes. And then I want you to come back and ask me a question about it. And it's just not going to happen. Exactly. Right? I'm with it, you. it really is. No, I'm with you, Seth. I'm with you all the way. And uh, that, that's, part of the, that's part of the joy of the work though. And I'm like, walking away from two days of training exhausted. I'm like, all right, did my work. And I, <laughs> I, I just, you know, I justified, I justified my insane rates. Sorry about that. I justified my rates to, uh, to make sure I, I added value. Right. And if people want to hop on the, after the training, you know, I make, I give them a copy of all the content, go ahead and steal it. I don't care. If you want an update, let me know. And if they have questions, if they, if they don't get something and want to have another follow-up, uh, I'll do a follow-up, you know, try to, Try to make make it something, not just to deliver something you care about. That's what education is. Most good educators that I know, they are not in it for the buck. They are in it because they care about education and want to make a difference. And I'm in it for the money, and I'm in it to make a difference as well. I want I want both to happen, right? <laughs> you, there's no reason you can't do both. And speaking yeah. of for the money, something that I, I the federal government is not my customer. I, I usually work in like California. I'm doing an event December 20th and 21st with CTO of Manicode, Jimmy Mesta, DevOps, Kubernetes training extraordinaire. We're doing a free training December 20th and 21st, 2018, end of this year, full two-day class specifically for federal workers, specifically for state workers and any political party, DNCR, and I don't care, GOP, whatever, any political party in the U.S., we're doing it for free. We call this event. Are you ready? Are you ready? Secure coding for America. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Seriously, are you making I'm, Are you making America secure again? Is that what you're doing? Trying to make America secure. What's that? You're gonna have. We, you're gonna pass out some hats. That's. I'm def <laughs> definitely not gonna pass out hats. I, I swear that, that. Like this is this is not my customer base. I'm just trying to do a good thing. I'm just thinking like. I feel very lucky the way things have gone, Seth and Ken. I'm very happy with my life. Things have worked out real well. And uh, I, I look at the news. I see all the, the, the mess that is going on right now, you know, around cybersecurity and, and how, so I want to I give back a little bit. So I'm doing this and I'm encouraging my counterparts in Canada. I'm encouraging my counterparts in Europe. They sh we should be doing this all over the world for our different countries. Those, because there's not a lot of educators in, and AppSec and secure coding. It's an extraordinarily small community of, of, of people. And so and I, 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 I sure I like money, but it can't stop there. This is what OWASP is all about. And this is what the, the different volunteer efforts are. And I think that's extraordinarily important to everyone in our industry because of how low uh, people resources are. So we're all getting paid pretty damn well overall. 
it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to give back. So get to it, everyone. That's right. Yeah, that's quality training they're going to get too. I mean, that's. I'm trying to find the link, but uh, I'll find it later and then uh, I mean, put it. I, okay, I don't even have a link. Just oh. email me. Email me like anything that you want or SC for America uh, uh, Secure Coding. That's SC four a at manacode.com and i'll put you on the list i have a flyer i have the dates reserved and I've, a, a large number of developers from the fed have si from different groups have signed up already so you know i'm, I'm stoked we it's it, it's on so right on and uh, i did want to mention bill Semph gave you uh, a, a little thumbs up on the uh, a little endorsement on your training so that's I, you real quick you mentioned code mash just a little while ago right just I, i'm yeah i haven't been in code mash in years i'm signing up for code mash because it's a it's a developer conference at a water park in the middle of winter which is the biggest water park in, indoor water park in the u.s so after those two days of talks that make us so tired that's when you go down to the bar get a drink go into the hot tub with the bar in it and then go yep. outside and then go outside into the raging winter Ohio storms while having a drink in the hot tub. And then you're like, yeah, okay, wait, let me do it. But then you're like, all right, this is, this is okay. Suddenly, <laughs> suddenly, uh, suddenly I'm all right. Well, me and I haven't been back since that year that we were there together either. Right. Every year I, you know, I've been talking, I know Kevin mm -hmm. Cody that we've had on a few times is a big fan as well. I, I mean, and it's not a security conference. It's a developer conference. That's one of the things that I love about it is it is you speaking to developers about security, but not uh, you as a security person speaking to other security person. You're avoiding the, the echo chamber as it were, right? Yeah, it's a developer conference. I'm not talking about anything exciting. All I'm talking about is secure coding minutia that is educational in nature, not not free, footloose, and fancy in nature, like like we'll see at, at more popular conferences. This is education. This is work. This is, yep. is, is when people show up at this training, it's, or, or even at a talk that I usually give. It, it's um, again, I'm trying I'm trying to teach them something new about complicated engineering material, and that's not you know that's not a pleasure cruise. This is hard work and complicated concepts that you have to go back to and reread and practice, and it's. It's just hard. So, yeah. you know, yeah, they, I mean, there's no reason why somebody is going to come into there and know that, hey, the first time that they see a SQL injection, they're going to understand everything about it, right? I mean, you start talking about all the different aspects and even something like cross site skip scripting. I mean, that, that was one thing that was on our list today. Oh, God. Uh, you know, was to talk about how uh, cross site scripting is a barometer for, or something for our industry. And I just want, I wanted to get your, your take on that and what, what it was you were trying to make a point about. Well, I, I want to point to to Mario, right? I'm going to point to Mario okay. Heinrich, who who who, uh, who who has given talks on the fact that nobody wants to solve XSS. Who wants to fix it? There's a mammoth industry around fuzzing for XSS in a variety of different ways, and he thinks that the incentive is not to fix it rather than fix it because we're still in 2018 with this with XSS being a relatively prolific problem across even major websites and. Why, why is this happening? I think SQL injection has been less of a problem. We've done a good job at, at corralling that if we want to, but why is but, XSS still, still with us? But see, I don't think that, I don't think that, okay, well, when you say we, you have to define we, because I think, and it might be actually, you could argue that security's influence on web frameworks is certainly like, I guess you could, you could definitely say we, because there's, there's, I've seen PRs from security folks on like, Active Record, for instance, yeah. and you're, you know, in this case, you've got a frame, you've got frameworks that are protecting against SQL injection just by the ORM and, and Active yeah. Record. Yeah, I, XS, XSS is nasty, complex. Now, <laughs> now, 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 I, I was at a, con I was at Locomoco, uh, and I met some of the GitHub guys there, and they had a very different perspective on it. They were like, "Yeah, sorry, Jim, XSS is not in our threat model anymore because we're so good at stopping it. We're worried about." markup injection and other kinds of injection that CSP is not as effective as dealing dealing with and but that's not fair. GitHub has an unfair like widget in their team. They got a Neil Matatal, you know, who's, who's <laughs> they got like the, the guy people who wrote CSP 
But that's interesting. Just to your point, some companies, and I'm, I don't work for GitHub, I, and, and this is at a public conference talking to some of the I people do. there. <laughs> yeah, uh, hello, hello there. But it's like XSS is to you as a as a elitist GitHub technician. You're like, oh, Jim, XSS means nothing to me. But that's not fair because you you don't live in the real world. You live in the world of GitHub magic dust. And yeah. and I and I applaud you guys. I applaud you guys. You guys have got XSS down. If anyone pops you with XSS, give them some bounty money because that's hard to pull off right now. And we certainly will give you bounty money if you find that and you report it. Uh, but um, so, you, so yeah. you you're 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 jaded. Sorry, buddy. You're an XSS jaded. You're out, you're out, Ken. Ken, you're out. Sorry. You're out. Oh, just me. I, I I I'm not out. I'm in because I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll tell you because uh, all these. It's it, well, all right. So let's let's talk about new frameworks for JavaScript. And okay, I mean, to your point, okay. those talks. I mean, uh, what's her name from, um, from Synops? Yes, exactly. Like cool, awesome thought, ways to get around. Um, what was it? Angular, Angular's yeah. built-in protection protections. Yep. She and then she just ripped that up. She had some really good, like XSS that she found inside of that framework. So give me another framework. What other JavaScript frameworks you care about? Uh, probably these days. Well, did I care about none? But React. I mean, but React's the popular one. Okay, go React, find yeah. go go find React code. Just go a little do little code search. Go look for dangerously set inner HTML. There's XSS number one. Then go do a search on uh, like um, href equals. Open to open curly bracket where you're putting untrusted data into an href context. Context. Give me a JavaScript link. Boom. Use XSS React. We just punched it twice without even thinking, Ken. So I, I, I don't I don't buy the argument that framework solves a problem. It, it makes it, e it it makes it easier in some ways to defend against XSS, and it makes it fifty times effing more difficult to stop it in other ways. Because you have to, when you're doing React, you're now doing low level JavaScript work. And what does that mean, Ken? Dom XSS. And it that's, does. And that's I mean, like that. Yeah, I was going to say to your point with, well, I was going to say to your point with like CSP, you know, I, I'll tell you, actually within the last, we'll say two weeks, twice, somebody, I won't mention who, hit me up and they're like, they're a blue teamer. And they said, I'm just finding XSS. I'm finding XSS over and over again. This is, I had 14 instances of XSS and I'm like, CSP, like you need... If you're a, if you're a small security team, especially a small AppSec team, get your CSP right because there's no way you can prevent every single XSS vulnerability from popping up, but you can certainly have limit the impact yeah. of that XSS with CSP. So I, I mean, Jim, to, to that point, is that, is, is that an education problem? Is that a you know? I mean, is that a training problem that we haven't addressed? Is that a like if it's not framework related and we can't solve it that way, which is how we solve SQL injection, right? Let's be honest, right? you know, the, the, the more that we push, this is the way that you interact with the database, that's how we've actually changed. So is there something that needs to change in those, in those languages to actually prevent cross-site scripting? Or are we falling back to the GitHub model where we're depending on CSP and something else outside of your code to actually defend against it? To answer the first part of your question, it is an education problem. I take personal responsibility, Seth, for all XSS. It is my fault. <laughs> it is <I'm>, sweet. <laughs> we're, we're done. I, we're done. And that, I, that's I'm, all we need. I've got the quote. I'm, <laughs> but I'm trying to mend my. I really am. I'm trying to amend my ways. I'm trying to. I'm trying my best to teach people XSS the right way. It's tough. There's. What, what do you have to? You have to escape. You have to use frameworks correctly. You have to sanitize HTML. You have to get CSP in place. You, you probably want to. Uh, you probably want your X, XSS protection header in, in some situations. You have to use safe syncs in JavaScript. Avoid inner HTML. DOM purify untrusted markup deep in the DOM. Have server side sanitizers, and get it right everywhere. Yep. That's the problem. Get it right everywhere. And so well, yeah, I mean it's, I, the whole, it's the whole source to sync problem, and the fact that like we we view untrusted code is trusted right I, I mean it's injection at some level but I like I still see that as an issue especially with, with coming from what what a developer considers to be a trusted source right internal database 
they assume that somebody else has, has looked at things that customers are putting into this database and they're not, and all of a sudden you're popping admin logins yep. or customer support things, and th th there's just so many paths. Yeah. This, this is why I don't think frameworks are the answer. And I, I, w and I wish the answer was. I think in some ways it makes it easier, but he here's the problem. You're going to use Angular, you're going to use React, you're going to use other JavaScript frameworks. That means you're writing on the client lots of low-level JavaScript in addition to working with the framework. It's not just a React code, it's the custom business logic and workflow stuff that you're doing around it. And unless a developer is well-educated in how to write low-level JavaScript in a secure fashion, which is, again, non-trivial, uh, there's certain syncs in JavaScript that are safe, like dot, dot .val assignments, and uh, inner HTML, if you're using DOM Purify around it, those are safe syncs. Inner HTML without DOM Purify is no longer safe. And uh, and I'm just saying, it's a lot of minutia for the JavaScript developer, they need to be educated. And it's not even complex, it's just esoteric knowledge that they need to have when writing code. And that's just not- that, 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 That's all out on Stack Overflow, come on. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that hurt, That that just hearing you say that, brought me great pain, right? Now in the crypto world, a lot of good cryptographers monitor Stack Overflow and try to fix things. I applaud them for doing that. But again, web security is a giant broad knowledge base. It's hard to keep all of Stack, it's hard to keep OWASP wiki dialed in and up to date. A shout out to Dr. Philip DeRick, a partner and friend of mine in the industry. I'm very proud of, of one of the, one of the um, work that I did at OWASP, the OWASP Cheat Sheet Series with 50 other volunteers, this giant, and Dr. Philippe is like, come on, Jim. Everyone gives you a pat in the back about this stuff, but you and I know what really is. It's opinionated, it's fragmented, it's not in the same voice, and it needs updating all over the place. So I know everyone loves your cheat sheets, but I, I don't, I think you can do better. And I'm like, and I'm like, you are right, I love you. I say, this, if you just hang out with people who like, tell you how great you are all the time. You're going to learn nothing and go nowhere. So more and more, I find myself associating with people who are like, Jim, we need, we need more from you, buddy. Come, come on, you, come on. You can do better than that. So Dr. Philip, Dr. Philip Derrick, wherever you is, thank, thank you for not patting me on the back about the cheat sheet series. We can do better. And this is exactly back to you, Seth. You're like, is this an education problem? Yeah, it is. It's hard to teach this stuff to developers. Even some of the most popular OWASP guides, the XSS defense cheat sheet. There's a lot of work we can do to fine tune that. And, and it's, it's hard to figure out what the best way is. Well, I've got a follow, I mean, I've got a question okay. for you because this this happens, speaking, since we're talking about crypto and we're talking about training, All like right. one, of the, one of the things that used to just irk the shit out of me when I would do training is afterwards, there would always be like that one, and it wasn't just afterwards, right? It was like, you, you know, this person, oh, yeah. why you're giving training. it's that person that wants to know the most advanced that, you know, they're like, I wish it was more advanced. I wish we learned like, you know, tenfold on crypto, et cetera, et cetera. And then the same person that when you do an audit in two months and you come back, they introduce some simple ass bug. Cause they didn't want to pay attention to the fundamentals. They were super bored in the class there, you know, which just wasn't elite enough or whatever. Gotcha. Like, I don't know if you ever deal with that or, oh, yeah. I mean, how do you like, how do you approach that? I, Cause I never, I never got to the point where I was like, Oh, I know how to handle these folks. You have done enough training that I'm guessing you've kind of gotten a strategy together for that. Yeah. I, th I think it's a good question. The, the question is, you know, how do you handle tough students, how, and more importantly, how do you handle a student who wants a much, much deeper take on AppSec and secure coding than the rest of the general audience? First, and let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about somebody who wants a, a tenfold crypto. I can't just cater to one student. I gotta make sure I'm catering to the scheduled course, the requested modules, and the audience in the room. I teach an hour or two of crypto basics and I'm out because that's, that's the, I don't wanna go beyond my own knowledge. And if someone wants a real full crypto course, I would not take it because that's not my main area of expertise. That is really hard stuff to teach applied crypto. I can talk about it. I can wrap it. I know enough as an AppSec pro, but not enough where I feel comfortable teaching it. So if, when people ask me for deep crypto classes, I'm like, go talk to Tom Tychek or, you know, go talk to, uh, the, there's a firm in Britain, one of the OS guys that, that are really deep crypto thinkers. There's a couple AppSec firms that know, that really delve into applied crypto, I, I, I recommend they go talk to them. So, the, and that's being, in, that's integrity in the business. I could have taken it, 
done a little dance and tried to sneak my way through it, made a big check. They'd have been upset. It wouldn't have been good, but I could have got paid and got through it. I'm not going to do that to people because that makes that makes it you know makes me look bad. It's low integrity. It makes them upset. So to answer your question, when people want really detailed topics beyond my capability or my team's capability, I, I'll, I'll recommend them to others. Now, when we're in class and people start asking advanced questions. If it's derailing us from the course, I'll answer carefully and succinctly and move on because these tough questions add a little spice. I don't want to completely shut it down, but if I spend a half an hour going into a side topic, I'm losing the rest of the audience and I don't want to do that. Now, there's another dimension to this. The other, the other part is, um, what if we have a, a difficult a difficult student who's asking lots of difficult questions and being disruptive, right? I, that, that's my that's that's my favorite student in the room because you know if they're smart and their disruptions are wise, then I celebrate their brilliance. I point the managers to that person and say, "There's one of your security champions," and I make sure that I, I try to augment their voice in the classroom and let them co-teach with me. Bring it on. Comment, give me your comments. How does this reflect your world? How does this reflect on your personal experiences at your company? How does this affect your policies? Oh, you want to lecture five minutes on that and you're smart and you know what you're talking about? I'm going to, I'll, I'll go back and applaud you and join you in. Now, if you're saying the wrong things and you're, you're actively making incorrect comments, that shows up quite a bit. Then I'll shut that down strongly. And usually the person will, after I've like, Re hopefully respectfully explain to them why they were wrong in some way they'll, they'll start they'll either quiet down or uh or or ask better questions so again my job is anytime it's a good participant who wants to go deeper and explore the edges of these topics it's our job to facilitate that as best we can without killing the schedule too much and when you have a disruptor in the room it's also our responsibility to shut that down for the rest of the classroom so yeah well, that's I'm, good. I'm, I'm, we're going a little circuitous, but there you go. Go, Ken. I'm sorry. No, that's no, that's a that's a good approach. My approach is usually for the latter half of what you just said. Usually, just ignore them, but um, it's probably better to just point it out. It's like that's a problem. You got to stop, you know. But uh, it, but I also it, imagine you know like it, your approach where you're talking about. Hey, look, this is these are the things we're going to cover, and we're going to stick to these things, and we can go outside a little bit of that. But you know, if you want specialized training on whatever topic. I can recommend someone probably a probably a good way to handle it you know but and also it doesn't i mean at the end of the day as long as they're not disrupting the other students it doesn't really yeah. matter but what is and what it why it matters and why it annoys me is that they're the they're the people that i find that introduce the bugs just because of ego oh, yeah. and <laughs> you know ego okay. and unwillingness to be flexible and learn new things and things yeah. like that so in class i like to play with those people i, I don't recommend you shut them down I don't because if I shut them down, I've done that before and I lost them. They're upset. They feel like they're not heard. They feel like I didn't, uh, they're not happy with their class experience. And when they tried to get involved, they were pushed back. Hey, that doesn't work in relationships, <laughs> right? That doesn't work in class. So when someone's willing enough to ask, even if they're upset, even if they're asking bad questions, even if they're asking off topic questions, I'm going to play with them and I'm going to try to at least give them. Give them a couple, I might not give them a whole mile, give them a couple inches though, so they can, they, we can take a few steps in that direction. And then I'll make an effort at, during the break to go talk to them, understand what their real interest is. Very often, I know what they're talking about. I just don't, I just can't teach an hour on it. And so I'll at least go find the research in that topic. Like certain, like there's a lot of new kinds of encryption that uh, I'm not even gonna go, <laughs> try to explain it. There, there, there's, there's edges around the encryption where I've, where I've seen papers on them. I've read one or two papers on them. It doesn't make me an authority. I'm not teaching it, but I'll point them to those papers and, and th that will sate them for a bit. So now I let them disrupt for five minutes, Ken. I, I, I communicate it with them, address their needs, gave them additional research, admit it, and here's the most important part, admit it to the class that I don't know. I used to be afraid to say I don't know in class. I, I'm not anymore because it takes the, takes the pressure off me, and it it adds respect, right? It adds it adds a, a accountability. People trust you more if you're willing to say you don't know as an instructor. So, oh yeah, I definitely know people who will, you know, and I definitely have been this person. Uh, 
study way like way more than you need to before a class just in case there's right. um there's Love and them. actually what was Love funny them. is well yeah what so with with jimmy actually since since you mentioned jimmy when he was on he got hammered the first time hammered with questions i mean he i mean just off the wall questions but they they were on topic but they were you know just like and he knew them all and we talked i was how did you how did you he's like well i came prepared so i admire that but at the same time um you absolutely have to be willing to say like i don't know i, I can agree with that um and yeah rather than trying to bullshit your way through it. Well, you can only say, I don't know, but here's what it brings up for me. I've heard about this stuff and I've heard about that stuff. And, and this is, I think this is interesting. And here's some more research in this area, but I honestly don't know. So I, I don't like to end with, I don't know. I at least try to tie it into something I actually do, or at least try to point people in the right direction or put it in the graveyard. Say, I, you know, I really don't know. Not, oh, not only do I not know, I don't even understand the question you're asking. So let's go write that down, put it on the board. This is the question you asked me. I really don't know. And I'll be like, by the way, you just stumped me. You stumped the teacher. Give me the double, double high five. Boom. Double. And, and I, you know, I make it a good thing. So you you want to lift these people up in class, these people. You want to lift up everyone in class, everyone, period. But, and so, you know, that's, that's my thing, Ken. Right? I don't, I don't, I, I don't want to leave, leave people behind. Leave no developer best. behind. You're leaving with the best possible experience that they can, that they can get from that. Yeah. which is better than my ignore <laughs> approach. <laughs> I, I, don't, I mean, I, mean, I, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, that with respect. Teach, I don't think you see that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't necessarily see you doing that, but I do see, uh, you know, I, I mean, I know my tendency is kind of to acknowledge as Jim is saying, and then like, all right, if they are one of those that's going to act out time and time again, you know, turn it over to them and make them answer the question. I mean, make them a focal point. Right. Um, let yeah. them help you teach the course because at that point they are going to get something else out of it because they're yes. having to explain what SQL injection is rather than just nitpicking what your answer is. Um, and that's, I, I, I mean, I think about like the, my first experiences teaching and actually like trying to go and tell people about application security. And I had to go like research everything because I was handed a slide deck and said, go teach this stuff. Right. And um, I learned more probably in that like two weeks about how like SQL injection and cross-site scripting actually worked than the previous two years of exploiting it, right? Because of the fringe cases before, but now you had to understand the whole aspect just in case you had one of those people in that course, right? So those are the people that you're trying to teach to or you're trying to cover as opposed to, hey, we're just trying to get that surface knowledge back out there. Um, anyway. <clears throat> So I'm, that, I'm with you. That's kind of my take on it. Um, I but I'm with you. Yeah. So what um, are some success stories that have come out of your, from your training? Like uh, what had, like what are the best things that have come out of your training when you've given it to a company? Have they come back to you and said, well, here was the result and this was amazing. And, and here's why. Early on in my training career, I, I would wait for, I would try to make a runner happen. This is really early when people had live services that were popular and relatively insecure. I'd talk about a certain technique or attack technique. People would hear about it for the first time. They would get up and run out of class to go back to their desk to fix some stuff. I'm like, oh, we got a runner. No, that's, that's, I'm <laughs> kidding there. I, what I like to see is real tangible results, like live in class. I was talking about a certain technical topic. I believe it was a straight up, it was a React issue. And I said, go search for dangerously set inner HTML. And someone searched for it, found it, and, and submitted a bunch of uh, you know, GitHub issues against their code base in class against it. And it got all jazzed about it. Like, oh, I see what's going on here. And they walk out telling their manager, hey, man, I need a couple days. Uh, I, I, I got to look at some of this stuff from class. Give me a couple days before I get back get back to the mainline work. That's awesome. Excited developers who are who could actively go find, find a few things directly during or after class. One customer, Ken, are you ready? I'm not going to mention who this is, but this is, my, this is the greatest success ever. One customer built and pushed a CSP policy live in class while I was teaching it Using the uh, using Google engineers uh, a CSP three level dynamic policy type work, they were a non whitelist policy. 
So somebody was working on a whitelist policy for years, still working on it. I'm like, <clears throat> you can you can get it. You don't need a whitelist stuff anymore with some of the three SP enhancements. I showed them a few examples of how to do that, and they pushed it live. And this is not a small website. This is a massive website in the middle of class without breaking anything. Yeah, baby. That I was really that, excited. That's about a that. huge accomplishment. That scared, I mean, the, for, for scared me a lot. I just thought, like, you did what? What did you do? No, turn that off. Report only mode. What are you doing? He's like, no, no, I got this. I got this. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I, I lost. I lost a night's sleep from that one, but but they did it, so I felt good. That's awesome. Uh, that's a, I mean, whenever whenever you have people fixing bones that you're training on in class, that's I would count that as a win. And I don't want to take credit for the knowledge. So th this is a presentation that I deliver from. Uh, Michelle Spagnolo and Lucas Weichelbaum at Google uh, called Making CSP Great Again from like two years ago, where they talk about uh, you know strict dynamic type CSP3 policies. And the big benefit of this is you use their work and small adjustments to it. It's like you can push this thing out live pretty quickly without, without uh, for some websites, you can push this out relatively quickly with CSP 1, 2, and 3 fallback in one policy real smooth. So, Ken, what do you, I, I, you're probably a whitelister, but what do you think about like the strict dynamic type policy philosophies that you see rolling around out there? You think that's reasonable? Strict dynamic policies, as in people are setting CSPs that I, yeah, I'm not familiar with. Okay, no, 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 no. Like when strict, strict, all right, here we go. Right, so strict dynamic is going to automatically propagate trust and discard all your whitelists. What that says is, if you if you're a developer putting this this JSP in your path, I'll load your dependencies for you. I'm going to assume that you you have at least good trust in in that part of your JavaScript hierarchy. But in line, I'm not writing anything unless it's properly nonced. Right, so this is a this is you know you have a, a not this is specifically for a nonced policy. If you're not doing nonces, you can do a real simple straight up CSP policy. You're done. No JavaScript inline. Move on with your life. But that's rarely the case. We we often have to do nonce policies to handle modern websites. But that gives you a problem of of hierarchies of building a whitelist is brutally painful. So CSP strict dynamic allows you to you know, auto propagate down a hierarchy in a JavaScript library. And it's, it's not as secure, but it's super easy to build and deploy. I'll pay in our chat. I'll paste you the policy they talk about. Go ahead and go ahead and doubt me. Ken. I, I respect well, my, that. I, I know you're, a, you, you're a GitHub elitist. XSS is not in my threat model. That's okay. No, I have a couple thoughts, but you know, <laughs> first being, yeah, I mean, I, I don't currently have to deal with anything. I, I don't currently, and also I've not had to deal with a situation before where we couldn't uh, non uh, we couldn't we couldn't move inline JavaScript out. I just I haven't come across that before. Um, that's I mean it sounds like that's a problem for others. It's just in my experience had hadn't been an issue. So, so um, CSP and then, CSP one is good for you. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ken. I'm sorry. Oh no, no, I was just gonna say like, and then in terms of anything that makes. I'm in favor of anything that makes it a little bit easier and and more secure to 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 prevent XSS. Having said that, I haven't actually looked at this, so I should probably not say too much. I, I'll go with your like. Let me get back to you on that. Um, my full opinion <laughs> on that, but I do think anything that helps developers make stuff more secure in, in an easy fashion is great. Um, but if what you're saying, Ken, is I don't do nonces, Jim. Nonces are for wimps. I'm gonna, you deserve a double high five for that. That's the right way to go. If you no, build your... Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you saw the post recently. Like there's, um, actually there's, so even jQuery and, and external libraries like that got ripped oh, yeah. out of the uh, GitHub source code. There was a tweet about this. Um, but, but, and they talk about the, it's like a handful of very simple things like selectors yeah. Uh, that have re completely replaced um, the need for any of these libraries. So right. I have Just to HTML, HTML5, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I can't remember the actual functions, but yeah, it's just basic. I'm trying to find the, the, the article. But yeah, it's just basic, um, basic JavaScript. That's all it is. It's nothing fancy. And it completely replaced. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm not only a fan of moving 
moving inline out to an externally, you know, access JavaScript file or I'm uh, sorry, externally to, to a JavaScript file. But what I'm saying is I also think like there's probably not a need for the insecure libraries that you see people use time and time again. It's likely not necessary. Ken, Ken. Yeah. Have I told you, I don't know if I told you this before. I love you, Ken. That is such a, <laughs> such deep wisdom. It affected me not just intellectually, but also emotionally. And you're a hundred percent right. So double, let's do this, Ken, double high five. Come on. Uh, there we go. Du do, double high five. No, no you're, you're spot on right. Stop using junky insecurity libraries for things you don't need to use them for and stop having, you know, stop having nonce policies just because you're being lazy. Get that, get, get that stuff out of inline, get that back to proper JavaScript structure. And you can have CSP one policies that are incredibly strong and do great things to eliminate XSS. And this is why GitHub doesn't have XSS under threat model, or so I've been told. Very impressed. So <laughs> it's it's in the threat model, but you know, there's so many things have been. If you if you should take a, I mean, take a look at the CSP for um for for GitHub. Uh, it is pretty. Hold on, I found the. Uh, put it here, and I put it here. It's actually just a tweet. I thought it was gonna be a blog. Um, I don't think it's an actual blog post, but basically it just says, you know, like, hey, we've replaced jQuery with query selector all, fetch for Ajax, et cetera, et cetera. So You're some right. really basic stuff. Um, where's it going with that? Yeah. So, uh, yes, yeah, so you can replace uh, crappy libraries with. Um, with well said. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, like, like as you jump into the dynamic stuff, that's what scares me about it, right? Yeah, it does give us a little bit more security, but the fact that the trust model is just, you know, from there on down, just go ahead and trust it, it is what scares me on it, right? Like, like honestly, from a from a you know, strict defense perspective, um, but that's not to say that it's not a good thing, right? I, I mean, it's like, hey, we're gonna do. So for cross-site scripting in general, we're just going to encode all HTML output, right? Yeah, there's still use cases there, but that that covers such a wide swath. It's probably a useful thing to go and do. So, so I like the idea, but it does still have a, a hole there that I'm like, all right, now we got to we're moving the we're moving the goalposts here a little bit, but we still need to address the real issue behind the scenes. I think that's fair. What's your opinion? <laughs> Dynamic. Did I lose you guys? I'm no, here. Oh, yeah, oh, no, Jim. No, 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 no. That's is right. That's is like you're you're both down on strict dynamic because it propagates trust. But the 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 reason I like it is because the world that that you live in, Ken, is a dream world, and it's a, it's a, for you, it's a living dream. For most people, though, it's just not going to happen. That they have marketing putting trackers in. They have all these fancy legacy widgets that are non-trivial to update. Like for modern media sites and it's it's they still have to live in a world where the way they've been coding for a decade is what they still want to go with for the next six months or year or maybe longer and and so I, I agree with you right. my my desire is what is what and what in fact when I started teaching CSP I echoed what you just said but I got beat up in class it's the other thing about being a teacher I get beat up a lot that's how I learn I don't learn just be just from studying I learn from interacting with really smart architects who correct me from time to time so it's a school of hard knocks. I'm like, very few could get away with CSP1 clean policy. They have to do these, they have to build these crazy whitelists. And in some cases, again, a, a good friend of mine has spent like over a year building a whitelist. He's almost there, but that, that's craziness. Where are, and, and all I'm saying is, how about this? While guy or, or guy or, or, or woman X is working on maintaining a whitelist policy, if that's still in the future, a strict dynamic policy can be pushed out re relatively quickly to, to give you time. It is not perfect. It's easier to deploy, and especially in existing live legacy applications, retrofitting CSP is a pain. And this is a way to make that retrofit a little bit easier and still gain risk reduction, especially in a modern browser. That's yeah, my pitch I mean, for it. That makes, a, that makes sense in, in the way that you could turn this on today and then have a plan for in a month, we'll say, or whatever it takes to six months, <laughs> more likely six months. Or a year. Yeah, no, or in two. the real world, not the dream world, uh, more likely six <laughs> months or more, you know, 
uh, if you don't have magic dust. And uh, then you can, you can, you know, kind of change your CSP and, and work things around and, yeah. you know, watch the reports exactly. and improve your CSP and how your architecture is. I mean, there's no doubt, like you're absolutely right because uh, this <clears throat> in previous lives, Yes, that's that's marketing has had a direct influence on what happens on your site, and and they always will, and there's a reason for it. It's, it makes money, right? So you're going to get, like you said, these requests for external tools and um, widgets and these crazy things, and you know that's another thing too. Is every time you have to, like, okay, one good thing about our policy, well, one other good thing about the policy is that when a change Basically, if someone tries to change those headers, we get notified, right? Because they want to allow something in. And yep. what's great about that is there's two parts. One, you have the opportunity to look at it and say, well, can't we vendor it? And if we can't vendor it, like, you know, why not? And the other part is, and also that you're aware of it, but also like uh, you get a chance to perform a review of that third party code if you've got the a sizable enough team. Like, obviously, there's limitations with people that have smaller teams. But if you have a, team that has the bandwidth, you can certainly perform assessments on, you know, that third party code. Absolutely. So, yeah. I don't know what I added there, but yeah, no, I, like your, I like your approach. I like the like use strict, strict dynamic and then get your shit together in six months. Like, right, so, maybe, so, so maybe, maybe, nine, maybe nine months. Web application firewall, right? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> why, why did you do that to me, Seth? Seth, why? <laughs> Why would you do that to me on your podcast? That was terrible. Oh, I'm sorry. I won't bring up anything more about yeah, laughs. I'll, I'll take that back. You know what? I remember Charlie Miller giving a talk at at AppSec California several years ago. What a nice guy! By what a what a kind human being, by the way. And uh, he was he was also comparing CSP to a firewall as a kind of firewall ish compensating control. So, yeah. So I know that that's well, not that that's not it's not a horrific thing to say. I'll forgive no, you. No, no, it's it, it, and, and that's the thing. It's like as far as a placeholder, when you have a path, that's the that, that's that's the piece that I like, right? Hey, we get yeah. a little bit of security, and it pushes us down the path of actually figuring something out. I don't like the idea of oh, I'm using this other technology to you know prevent me having to actually yeah. figure out the root cause, right? And, and I I, th I think most people would agree with this. Or with me in that in that space, right? But uh, yeah, I, I mean, WAF, that was tongue in cheek, obviously. But you know, I'm you gonna know say that, something controversial. Yeah, I, bring it on, Kevin. I, I like the idea. I like the idea of rasps. I like the idea of it. I have never and probably will never implement that in production. But I like the the, the theory and the idea behind it. Before you take me into your rasp loving world. <laughs> And I'll wait, go wait, there wait. with you. We go, we go back to WAF for a second. We go back to WAF. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's finish but, that before one before we, we, I need, whew, You rasped me. I will get back to that. But no, with, with WAF, as an academic secure coding instructor, I always dramatically make fun of the WAF. But as a guy who sometimes defends real websites or helps people defend real websites, ooh, suddenly I like a WAF, right? So no, I, I mean, I joke around about WAFs a lot. It's, it's part of the show sometimes. A WAF is a completely, leg a completely legitimate part of a website's defensive infrastructure. Of course it is. There's a lot of different ways to deploy it, different uses for it, from logging to just virtual patching to more active defenses. What We could debate that all day. But I think we all know there are use cases for WAF that we cannot deny. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's completely fair, right? Uh, I mean, uh, I think most uh, of our taste, most of our like, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> most of the bad taste in our mouth on there and we are going to quote this all jim right you know that right but <laughs> yeah we're yeah, we're not live it's just you and you and me we're not live yet yeah, yeah we're not live you can say whatever uh, you want jim is responsible <laughs> for xss according to jim <laughs> all xss is my <laughs> fault because of poor <laughs> education all yeah. access the whole world yes. and use a yeah. laugh yeah <laughs> i think the whole bad i think the whole bad blood with WAF though Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, 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 I think the whole reason. I mean, I don't know what your theories are, but I think one of the main reasons people don't like WAFs are that what what often happened was what often happens with security products. Someone <laughs> slick slick 
slick salesperson came in, sales engineer might have helped them out. They paid for, they paid their price. They got their, you know, appliance. They got one of their software, whatever it was. And, um, and then that's it. It was installed and then that, that's it. It was never, you know, like you don't have support. You don't have people that know what they're doing with it. And often, as often is the case, it's being used as like a, to, to mask the real problem, which is having a lack of, or a lack of staff, a lack of trained security staff, uh, a lack of training, a lack of a lot of other things. Um, and it's just, you know, we'll buy this, check that box, and that should mask some of these problems. And, and I think that that's maybe why people hate WAF so much, besides the fact that like, you know, there's there's been, yes, there's been bypasses, there's been um, exploits on WAFs themselves, but, you know, th I personally think that's where all the hate comes from or developed from. I also think the idea of, of how WAFs were sold in the early part of the AppSec industry I don't think they're sold this way anymore, but they were sold. I remember Schulman from Imperva early on. He was like, oh, it's not natural for developers to parameterize your queries. Stop trying to fix your code. Just get a WAF. And, and I don't see that message anymore, but that kind of message is, is Bullstein of the highest order. Horstein, Bullstein <laughs> mixed with Dogstein. We, it just, and that's why I have a bad taste. But I, I've listened in. Customers are like, all right, Jim, we want you to be a fly in the wall to this WAF salesman. You're the, and don't talk. They'll mute me. <laughs> it's hard to mute me, but they try. <laughs> and I just listen in. And I'm like, all right, this is legit. That was an honest conversation about what a WAF actually does and what, and what the purchaser's responsibility is. Oh, yeah, I'm into it now. So, you know, it, it it's depends on how it's so, it is. The sales marketing and how it's postured has matured and, and i think that helps the whole industry as well yeah. i had a similar yeah. experience with appscan uh, source before where someone someone purchased appscan source and they were told or maybe it was ounce back then i, I honestly can't remember but they purchased it now i think it was appscan source they purchased it and the, the they were told that this was just something their developers could run in their uh local on their local dev environment and it would just tell them if there were any vulnerabilities. You just installed the box, pointed the, I don't know, po point the uh, point and click the setup. Uh, shouldn't take long. And then um, everybody's ready to go. In reality, if you've ever worked with, and I know the three of us have, if you've ever worked with AppScan Source Edition, you know, or Ounce, as most of us know it on this right. hangout. It's super complicated. It is not, that takes, that takes a bit of training and a lot of time to learn how to use that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is installation is not exactly easy, right? And the third thing is the cost is extremely high. So the idea is you come to me and you say like, let's say I'm this, in this case, I'm the sales guy. The customer came to me and said, I need for my developers to know when they're introducing vulnerabilities. And I'm like, I got a solution for you, not actually thinking through anything other than the invoice, right? And that's, yeah, that's- I'm with you, I'm with you. And that's yeah, happening no, I, less because consumers are getting educated more about, about what AppSec is, so. Anyway, I'm sorry, yeah. Seth. No, no, I, like, you're right. I mean, it's an education thing. It, 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 it's a compliance issue, right? You think about WAFs back in the day and the big driver was PCI because it was like, yeah. hey, if I just go buy this product, I can throw it in and never mind that if you put a, you know, or two equals two instead of or one equal one, it bypasses the WAF, right? And it was just like a complete misunderstanding of what yes. was really the, the point behind it. Um, that drove the whole that, that drove the whole industry, and I, I like I still like I have a hard time as I look across the industry for like the cloud security tools nowadays because I feel like there's a lot of that kind of same language and the same like compliance, uh, just bullshit, right? To to steal your phrase there, Jim. That's going into hey, we're we're taking advantage of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt to push our product. Um, because I, as a salesperson, don't really understand how I'm supposed to push this as it is, right? That there's no education for me or for the customers on it. So we're just going to take that slick and we're going to say, hey, all your problems are now solved because, because my developers went and put together something that interacts with both Google Cloud and AWS. Um, so, I, I mean, that, that kind of brings us to a point, right? I, like, I, I know we, we haven't really addressed RASP yet, Ken, but, you know, maybe we can come back to that later because we have been going for almost an hour and 10 here. Um, but I wanted to get to 
the future of AppSec, right? We talked about the past, we've kind of talked about what's going on right now, but what do you see as kind of the next big wave? What is it that you're seeing in the industry that excites you or scares you as we move forward? That's a good question. I try I try not to engage these kinds of questions, but I, I think it's important so we can predict what we should be investing in as big companies around AppSec as things move forward, right? We're going back to Ken and the wisdom of Ken. Frameworks are a critical piece to, to developer-centric AppSec maturity, right? As Imagine if if we had serious budgets and you, me, Seth, and if we can pick, get Mario involved, get a few people involved that we know are good, and let's build a software development framework from the ground up with security in mind. Or what if we had like a year and like 10,000 hours to fork Spring and make a limited version of it that was even more secure than, than Spring Boot, which is a meta configuration layer for Spring Security, which is a configuration layer for Spring. You know, I mean, if, if we had the right people and the right time and budget to make a framework for software engineers, we could do some amazing things today when app, in application security. But there's very few of us that are incentivized to do that because most of the frameworks we depend upon is from the open source world. And it's, you know, it's, it's uh, not a, a commercial activity that we can usually monetize or benefit from. Who wants to pay a lot of senior AppSec expensive people to build a real secure framework with a bunch of developer architects? When that happens, we will really start to accelerate in the world of developers. The promise that you want, Ken, that frameworks will largely solve the problem. I don't think we're there yet, but I think that with the right effort, we could be. That needs to happen. And I think in this generation, we're seeing the, the first pieces of that. React and Angular are, are examples of frameworks in the, in the client that were really, they really tried to build them with security in mind. There's mistakes, but they tried. I think that's the real future, no question about it. And, and, and here's the other thing, Seth. If we don't do that, we're done. We're gonna we're gonna be chasing. We're gonna be in the hamster wheel forever, and people will make a lot of money finding more XSS. Help us, God help us all. But so we've got. We, <laughs> yeah. I think it's a, that's a requirement to go to the next generation, hands down. Yeah, I, I, I like. And that that feels so difficult to me right now. I, like I have no doubt that we can do it, right? Like I, I, like I know the brain trusts that are out there. We know the people that have have put together like extremely secure sites and frameworks on top of what's currently the, out there. But the fact that the developer community is so splintered as well, right? Yes. I mean, we we always tease Ken that he's the Rails guy, right? You know that he loves Rails so much when it's just like what he's specialized in. But the same thing goes across the board, right? Like, I, you know, I've got a lot of experience in Python and Django and some in Java, but like Node, and then you start talking Swift and you start talking about these new frameworks as they're coming out. So building on the top of that, I just don't feel like there's an organization that's out there that can necessarily invest that amount of time or the time that's needed to create those secure frameworks to use uh, until you get to the developer layers, until you get to the apples of the world or the academics that are creating these new languages, it's a very difficult problem to solve. So it's like we're, we, we fall back to the education at some point, really. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, so, cause it, I guess the it being the, the the point I think that you you've made that I want to pinpoint is like our gym is the uh, the fact that you said that it has to be funded. I agree a hundred percent. Somebody's got to somebody has to fund that initiative. Otherwise, like it's it's not gonna it's not gonna happen, right? I mean, I agree. I, just, I love uh, or I love organic open source efforts. I do. When it comes to like revolutionary software frameworks. I want senior architects, senior AppSec professionals, and real budgeting. But again, there's not a, I don't think there's a commercial, like, neat, I don't think there's a, a commercial way to, to easily make enough money to do it correctly. This is, these are giant efforts. But I think that as things get worse, as governments and big, big entities need this kind of stuff more and more, and they realize that the way we're doing AppSec now is so brutally expensive with, the different what we focus mo what do we focus on in our industry ken what's the where's the where's the money flow in terms of appsec work bugs bugs find those bugs when we stop and when we invest in the building of software 
equivalent to how we look for bugs in software, that's that's what's going to be the the evolution to the next level. And I, I still have hope because React gives me hope, Angular gives me hope. Some of these auto auto escaping frameworks, or uh, uh, SQL SQL interfaces that remove injection. All these, it's in, like Rails Active Record Magic, the uh, link for SQL in .NET, the capabilities access control design in modern versions of .NET, the <clears throat> the built-in use of good password storage crypto in in a Django. All these pieces are there and done. It just needs to. We need to, you know, unify these into one professional framework, and it's going to happen. Just not as fast as I wanted to, and when it does. When we can look at a framework and go, this is the, I'm going to go to my philosophy almost major. This is, this framework is the platonic form of what a security developer framework should be. It's the paragon of all developer frameworks from a security perspective. And just looking at it, you have to glint away. Then, then we will make the next hop and it's going to happen within a decade. That's my that's my call. And you need adoption. You need to you need developers to actually want to use it. Right. And I mean that. I mean we've seen companies who are pushing who are actually like when I say companies, what I mean are global economic powerhouse companies. Capital One's a good example. It's a good example of a company that actually is pushing Node code. That's actually pushing like modern frameworks. And the whole reason they're doing that is because of their developers internally saying these are gotcha. this is what we want to use. This is what's best for the job. And this is what is going to bring in quality developers. Because developers want to work on what they want to work on, right? Like they want to be happy in the language and the framework they're working in. So just to add to your point, I think that's another thing that you'd have to you'd have to be uh, cognizant of as you build it is to make it something people would want to adopt. Here's an example of of that of of this exact paradigm. How did we store keys ten years ago when we were teaching developers about key storage, big part of secure software? How do we tell people to do it a decade ago? Hopefully not in source code, but environment variables. We'll say yeah. no, no, no. I mean, if if we were good about it, I, I try to keep away from environment variables for for security keys. I'd usually talk about HSMs, right? This is the early and oh, yeah. uh, and yeah. using sec secure hardware to store keys. That was what that that's what cryptographers told me. To, uh, applied cryptographers had taught me to teach the developers, or maybe I was compromised by HSM companies, but HSM came up a lot. Physical, a physical, a physical drive that even if it's stolen, it's gonna be difficult to extract the keys, right? But a big. Also, and then like a few years later, we would talk about isolation, where it's not just enough to use an HSM, you're pulling keys in and out of the HSM, you're defeating the purpose. So let's build a vault around the, the HSM so keys are never accessed by developers. And now we don't even talk about HSMs within developer secure coding industry. We talk about secrets management now, which is a much easier interface into how you store keys. That's the example of the framework progression that we need in, in all levels. And so like, take a look at our crypto libraries. I used to talk about Google Keysar, which is which is awesome. It, it had, it, at the time, it had good default crypto. How do I deal with the keys though? Good luck with that. Now look at how this has evolved. We have Google Tink with native integration into Google Key Store, Amazon Key Store, and similar. So key management, they still have work to do, but it's now a more integrated part of the framework. Now take that and give me five more years of work on how secrets management are integrated with software frameworks, and we're getting closer to the kind of world I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, now even in the in, in the cloud in cloud services, it's it's something that's easier to work with at the, the Absolutely. For, I mean, like you mentioned, Google, like AWS has built certainly services dedicated to it to make it cost effective, but also easy so that then people aren't putting their keys out in the source code and leaking into some source code repositories. But yeah, they, it, that has been made easier on a lot of levels and in the ecosystems that developers are working in. Seth, I'm sorry, what were you gonna say? No, I like, I was just gonna agree, right? You know, the, the the panacea is there. Um, and I mean, this is where I, I dig OWASP actually bringing things together because I don't see, it's it's gotta be some organization that's not necessarily 
is strictly tied to one framework or one language that's actually pushing that, right? Or even one backend provider. You know, you look at some of the the Amazon tools and things that they've come out with. Those are super uh, useful and they're very secure, what what have you. But they are still all run by Amazon. It's it, it, until it becomes kind of an industry wide thing. It's harder to see that as a panacea that we've accomplished what we want to accomplish there. So, but it's it's part of the evolution, right? It's things. It's yeah. so much better than what developers had in front of them, even say five years ago. And so this, this is why when you're asking me, well, look in the future. What do you, what do you see, Jim? Well, I see developers fine tuning all this stuff like more and more and more. So it's another generation or two generations of making it easier to do this stuff. It's because this is just a reflection of of not perfection, but of a of a step that has demonstrated maturity in an area of developer application security that's not productized, that's not uh, it's not attacking, it's not scanning or pen testing. It's part of the building of secure software that's evolved, not because of AppSec mostly, because of developers. And so yeah. it's, 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 and it's going to keep happening and, and I'll revise my estimate. Maybe 15 years out is a better estimate, but that, and that's when, again, we have that Titanic leap. That, that's what I'm going for and I'll stick with it. No, I can't. Yeah. I, like, like realistically, I'd love to see that. Right. I'd love to yeah. see that, 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 that layer sitting on top of node or implemented in node or something like that, where, where I can point to it and say, you know what you're trying to do? They've already done it over there. So just either go look at it or go do it. Um, that's going to make life so much easier. Um, I mean, there's still going to be problems that pop up. We know that. There's still going to be developers, and it's still you've still got to implement your SDLC properly in order to get to that point. But the framework will give us such a good base to work from that, yeah, I have I, I, I'll be excited to see. So 15 years from now, we sit down, we have this discussion again, and we just like wipe our hands and we're done. That's what you're saying? Nah, no, no. <laughs> come on. Yeah, we never wipe our hands and are done. We can just focus on a different, a much different set of problems. And it's it's less and less just blame developers' massive insecurity. Be much, much better overall risk posture at AppSec. Right now, it's horrific. And I, I envision a day where it's not like that. 15 years out. Yeah. And frameworks will be will lead the charge. Okay. All right. So no more XSS in 15 years because Jim will have fixed it all. Got it. That's, that's what I'm taking from today. <laughs> that's te that is that is a gross misrepresentation of anything I said or believe Seth. So, but but you go but you can go oh, with it. It's all no, right. You can go with it. All right. That's, that's okay. <laughs> gross mischaracterization. That's that's all right. Let's all right all right do it to me, Ken. Come on, let's do this. You know you know what time it is, Ken. Well, I was just going to say, I, it's about time to close up. So I was going to ask you if you had any parting thoughts you wanted to leave to folks uh, before we get off and, and before we jump off the podcast. And I also wanted to mention, we're honored to have you on and uh, appreciate Very you. Very much so. You, yes. Yeah. Appreciate you joining us. So all, you know. You guys are awesome. I, I think you're both great professionals and it's, it's my honor to be here as well. We can't go yet. Just give me, just give me 30 seconds on RASP. Let's wrap up with some rest. That? <laughs> well, our, that, that was me just kind of throwing out something that I actually, I, I like in theory, the concept of RAS. Now, again, I've never put one into production. I've ran it only in a sample sort of case. Um, and like I said, I probably won't ever put that into production. Um, but who knows? I'm, I'm open to it. You know, seems seems like a cool concept. So that's me saying, hey, I'm I'm okay with the idea of it. I'm not sure certain about the implementation part. That's the part that scares me, but I only have two things to say about RASP. I'll say two things. Number one is go give contrast.com a try. It's a great RASP product. I owe you that, Jeff. That's right. Go. That is I said it. That's right, Jeff. Go try contrast. Number two, Jeff, I'm sorry I trashed you in a keynote at OWASP. I'll never do it again. I apologize. That was that was oh that was a, that was below the belt low blow. I didn't like that either. I'm not going to do it again. And go by contrast. Just get a couple. Don't even try it out. Just go buy a few licenses, right? Oh well, we you know that's nice of you to say, but uh, I've seen contrast, and it, you know here's the thing. Go ahead, go ahead. What happened to Immunio? Actually, they got acquired, right? They got acquired. Yep. 
who did they get acquired by? I'm trying to find that information because I liked Immunio's product when I'd seen it. Um, and I, I like Seeker from Synopsis too is pretty decent. I, I'm their partner of mine. I'm I'm tied to them, but the yeah. other big one is Seeker, right? That's one of the early early raspy products out there on the market, right? Right. Yeah, I've only seen like so. I've seen a little bit of contrast. I haven't seen Seeker. I've seen um, Immunio. Uh, both right. products looked at least somewhat promising. Um, I think I liked, you know, because I, I full disclosure, I you know, I went out to a couple of dinners with the the with the uh, owners of Immunio. Immunio. Oh, right so on. I also like them as people. But um, I, got, I got you. I got you. Right, but but that doesn't mean that I wasn't critical of the product. But I thought it. I thought it was. A, I thought it was kind of a nice idea uh, to get that detection within your code base, to get those alerts, to see those uh, security type exceptions, to have automatic protection if you wanted it, um, and because it was for like basic stuff that you right. should absolutely like, you know, C surf, SQL injection, all that kind of stuff. So um, the idea being that it would prevent it before, like, even if you introduced that issue, it would prevent that issue from being exploited if it saw a weird like a weird sql injection string or something like that so anyways concepts sound very similar to, very well they would probably disagree with that but i guess in 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 from a fifty thousand foot view same concept as a waf using a tool to detect malicious con content and actors and yeah i worry about the agent hit of it having just told agent but at this point we're having such a hard time with appsec I'm willing to consider any solution at this point. So I'll leave with that. Yeah. I, yeah. They, I mean, sc I think maybe scaling could might, might be able to help with that. But again, it's, that's the reason I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, I'd be too, too, uh, as of right now, I'd be too afraid to, um, to put it into production, uh, without right. first having going through a nice trial. Of course. Yeah. So, but anyway, sorry, uh, anything you wanted to uh, to leave us with or the viewers with, I mean? No, just thanks for your time, Ken. Thank you for your time, Seth. And it's a honor to be on your podcast. Hope to come back again someday and hang with you guys. Thank you for having me very much. Yeah, yeah. Th no, as I said, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, it's been great to talk to you. I, I mean, you know, and see you somewhat face-to-face, -face, right? <laughs> you know, from my you know, computer screen, but... Um, yeah, we'd love to have you back on sometime, right? You know, it wouldn't be anything too onerous or, or too soon, especially as you have something else to talk about. Uh, we're more than happy to, to discuss it. And I am rep I am repping my OWASP shirt from DEF CON. Good so man. I went, by, I went by and saw those guys. We'll be down at AppSec USA as well, so we'll have to go I'll hang see you out. There. Yeah, we'll see you there. a good time. So. Yeah, don't, don't jump off uh, just yet before we sign off. Uh, Seth, anything we needed to mention? I still haven't gotten swag out to people, so uh, I guess. No, I don't, I don't think so. We've mentioned AppSec USA. We've mentioned AppSec Day in the past. Um, you know, we're doing those trainings as well. Uh, other than that, uh, we'll be at CactusCon towards the end of September. Um, come by and say hi. If you want swag, let us know. That's, oh, that's everything right. that's on my list. Yeah, I should mention I got I, you got confirmed for training. I think training at CactusCon, right? Or a workshop. Training. Yeah, workshop. Yeah. I got confirmed for speaking there. Um, so, yeah, see y'all at CactusCon. And uh, next week, uh, who do we have on docket? I should probably say that before we cut. Yeah, uh, the next uh, next week is Asta Singhal. I hope I'm saying that right. I'll oh, Asta. Yeah, I haven't from Netflix. That'll be fun. Yeah. Yep. Runs the AppSec over at Netflix. So, all right, cool. Well, thanks again, Jim. Thank you, people, for watching. Seth, anything else? Nope, that's everything for me. All right. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks.